Every mechanical failure is at its core a failure of material selection. Today, we will cover the materials that every mechanical engineer needs to understand. This isn't about memorizing material properties like what's the elastic modulus of steel or aluminum, nope. but rather selecting the optimal material as part of the decision-making process in product design. We'll break down the major classes of engineering materials from high-performance alloys to advanced polymers and examine the precise selection framework that mechanical engineers use in practice. We'll also bridge the gap between material properties and manufacturing reality, discussing how your choice of metal or plastic dictates whether you'll be using injection molding, five axis machining, or additive manufacturing. By the end of this video, you'll understand how to exactly select materials, make trade-offs between strength, density, cost, and manufacturability, and why certain materials dominate specific industries. To select the material, you first need a mental map of the available landscape. So we categorize engineering materials into four primary families, each based on their atomic bonding and resulting macroscopic behavior. Metals form the backbone of mechanical engineering. They offer a predictable balance of strength, stiffness, toughness, thermal conductivity, and manufacturability. Ferrous alloys like steel and cast iron are used where cost-effective strength and stiffness are paramount. Think of structural I-beams made from A36 steel or automotive engine blocks made from gray cast iron where vibration damping is required. Non-ferrous alloys like aluminum 6061 or 7075 is the standard for aerospace applications and portable electronics due to its relatively high strength to weight ratio. Copper alloys like brass and bronze are selected for electrical conductivity or low friction applications like bushings. Titanium combines corrosion resistance with high strength at elevated temperatures. Nickel-based alloys dominate extreme thermal and chemical environments. Moving on, polymers and engineering plastics are indispensable in function-oriented design and prototyping. Polymers excel when weight reduction, electrical insulation, chemical resistance, and vibration damping matter more than absolute stiffness. They also allow for a complex geometry without secondary machining. The trade-off you have to make for plastics is sensitivity to temperature, creep, and long-term aging. Thermal plastics such as nylon, ABS, and peak can be melted and reshaped, making them the kings of mass production where cost, weight, and corrosion resistance are important. Applications range from simple consumer enclosures to high wear gears and automotive transmissions. Thermal sets such as epoxy and phenolic resin cannot be remelted once they are cured. These are used as the matrix in carbon fiber or for high heat electrical insulation. Ceramics and glasses offer exceptional stiffness, thermal stability, wear resistance, and chemical inertness, but suffer from zero ductility. In mechanical design, we use them for specialized applications like alumina for high voltage insulators, silicon carbide for sail faces and pumps, or tungsten carbide for the cutting edges of end mills. The successful use of ceramics depends on controlling stress concentrations, understanding fracture mechanics, and designing for compression rather than tension. Now, composites are the strategic combination of the previous three families. By embedding high stiffness fibers like carbon or glass into a ductile polymer matrix, we create anisotropic materials that deliver high stiffness and strength along specific load paths at extremely low weight. Anisotropy just means that the material's physical properties vary depending on the direction in which they are measured. We use these when we need to tailor the material strength to specific load paths, such as and wind turbine blades or Formula One monocoques. Composites demand careful consideration of anisotropy, manufacturing variability, inspection difficulty, and repairability. They excel in aerospace, motorsports, and high performance structures, but are rarely chosen purely for cost or simplicity. In industry, mechanical engineers don't pick materials based on gut feeling. We use a systematic approach often referred to as the Ashby method. The process follows four distinct steps. Step one is translation. You must convert your design requirements into functional constraints by asking what must the part do. Load paths, operating temperatures, environmental exposure, stiffness targets, wear conditions, and lifespan define the acceptable design space. A bracket that sees static load at room temperature invites very different material choices than a rotating shaft exposed to cyclic stress at elevated temperature. If you're designing a B 
dream is your goal to minimize mass or is it to minimize cost for a given stiffness these are two different mathematical problems step two is screening this is binary does the material meet the non-negotiables if the component operates in a corrosive saltwater environment non-treated carbon steel is screened out immediately regardless of its strength manufacturing constraints eliminate a large portion of the material landscape early as well casting forging machining injection molding additive manufacturing and forming each impose material compatibility requirements a theoretically ideal material that cannot be sourced reliably is also not viable step three is ranking this is where we leverage an optimization tool called an ashby chart because these charts use log log scales complex power law relationships between properties appear as straight lines we plot the two competing properties for example young's modulus versus density to find the quote-unquote best material we apply the material index derived from our design equations for a light stiff beam that index is young's modulus to the power of one half over the density on the chart this index manifests as a selection line with a specific slope in this case it's a slope of two by shifting this guideline toward the top left corner which is the region of high stiffness and low density we can instantly isolate the optimal material candidates any material sitting above your target line exceeds your performance requirements allowing you to prioritize secondary factors like cost or lead time without compromising on the primary mechanical constraint finally step four is validation and iteration prototypes testing and dfm feedback refine the selection in many cases the final material differs from the initial choice because of manufacturing yield supplier capability or unexpected performance limitations now material selection is inseparable from the manufacturing process the perfect material is useless if it cannot be formed into the required geometry at a viable price point machining which is a subtractive process generally applies to metals like aluminum steel and brass as well as engineering plastics like delrin we choose machining when we need high precision for example tolerances of plus minus one hundredths of a millimeter and low to medium annual production volumes injection molding is used with thermoplastics like abs polycarbonate and nylon this requires high upfront tooling costs for steel molds but offers the lowest per part cost for high volume production die casting is essentially plastic injection molding for metals it uses non-ferrous alloys with lower melting points like zinc aluminum or magnesium for complex thin walled metal parts like transmission housings or engine components forming and stamping on the other hand rely on the ductility of metals low carbon steels and certain aluminum grades are preferred here if you're designing a car body panel you need a material with a high work hardening exponent so it can be stretched without tearing additive manufacturing aka 3d printing leverages several different technologies fdm and sla technology uses polymers for prototyping or creating things like low stress jigs sls and dmls use metal powders like titanium 6 aluminum 4v or stainless steel 316l this is selected for geometry first designs and in use parts with internal cooling channels or topology optimized brackets that are virtually impossible to machine or cast now let's apply this to a real world comparison in every machine shop 6061 t6 aluminum is the default because it's highly weldable easy to extrude and relatively inexpensive its yield strength sits at 275 megapascals however in aerospace structural members like wing ribs or high stress brackets we almost always pivot to 7075 t6 7075 is alloyed primarily with zinc which allows for a much higher precipitation hardening response pushing the yield strength to over 500 megapascals that's nearly double the strength for the same density but there is no free lunch in thermodynamics as we say the high zinc content in 7075 make it prone to hot cracking during welding as the weld pool cools the low melting point constituents segregate at the grain boundaries and pull apart under thermal stress so if your design requires welded joints 7075 is actually a liability 7075 also has significantly lower fracture toughness and poor corrosion resistance than 6061 if your component is subject to cyclic loading in corrosive environments like a landing gear assembly 7075 is at risk to stress corrosion 
cracking. In these cases, we often use a 7050 alloy or a specific T73 temper, which sacrifices some raw strength to gain resistance to environmental cracking. Now, before we continue with 2026 just starting, it's the perfect time for us to build healthy habits and kick off the new year strong. One of my favorite platforms that has really helped me bridge the gap between textbook theory and real world application is Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant helps you excel in math, physics, computer science, data analysis, and AI with visual interactive problem solving and personalized practice. Brilliant is extremely effective because you learn through active problem solving, a method proven to be far more powerful than watching lectures or videos. It has a perfect mix of interactive problems and motivating challenges and encourages you to keep making progress. Brilliant starts you at the right level based on your background, designs practice sets and reviews personalized for you, and helps you advance at your ideal pace. Brilliant is crafted by award-winning teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Harvard, Stanford, Caltech, Google, and more, so you learn from the best. With Brilliant, you don't just memorize formulas. You get hands-on with concepts until they make sense and develop the intuition and problem-solving skills to figure things out on your own. One of my favorites is Brilliant's scientific thinking course that teaches you how to think like an engineer with lessons in physics, gear systems, digital circuits, and more. To learn for free on Brilliant for a full 30 days, go to brilliant.org slash engineering gone wild, scan the QR code on screen or click on the link in the description below. Brilliant's also given our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. Now there's a common misconception that metals are always stronger than plastics. From a pure tensile strength standpoint, that may be true, but mechanical engineering isn't done in a vacuum. Consider the plastic peak. It's a semi-crystalline high performance thermoplastic whose tensile strength is roughly 100 megapascals, which is much lower than 4140 steel, but its density is 1.3 grams per cubic centimeter compared to steel's 7.8 grams per cubic centimeter. In high speed reciprocating components, the mass of steel parts creates massive inertial loads. By switching to peak, you reduce the reciprocating mass by nearly 80%. This reduction in inertia often outweighs the lower raw strength, allowing the machine to run at higher RPMs with less less vibration. Finally, we look at the extreme end of the spectrum, super alloys, specifically cobalt-based and nickel-based alloys like Inconol 718, which is a high-strength corrosion-resistant nickel-chromium super alloy. For standard steels, once you cross 500 degrees Celsius, the yield strength drops off a cliff due to creep, which is the slow permanent deformation under constant stress below the yield point. In the hot section of a jet engine, temperatures exceed 1,000 degrees Celsius. Here we use super alloys because of their gamma prime precipitate phase. Unlike most alloys, these precipitates actually impede dislocation motion more effectively at high temperatures, allowing the material to maintain mechanical integrity near its melting point. These materials are nightmares to machine because they work harden almost instantly, which is why turbine blades are often produced via investment casting as a single crystal to eliminate grain boundaries where creep failure starts. If you ever see a part made out of Inconol, you're looking at a component designed for time-dependent strength. It isn't just about how much load it can take today, but how much load it can take at 1200 degrees Fahrenheit for 10,000 hours. So to conclude, material selection is not a secondary task to be performed after the design is finished in CAD. You have to treat it as the foundation of the design and geometry itself. Whether you are optimizing for the high strength requirements of 7075 aluminum, the inertial advantages of peak, or the thermal stability of a super alloy, your goal is to match the material's quote unquote personality to the functional requirements of the part. All right, guys, that's it for today. Hope all of you had a fantastic new year and that 2026 is your best year yet. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, be sure to check out my video here where I talk about the mechanisms that every mechanical engineer should know. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.